Well, back to digital communications. And we have to talk about – let's do the lightning overview of what we talked about last week. Of course, we did sampling, quantizing, talked about compression. We've now got this rich stream of ones and zeros. What do I mean by a rich stream of ones and zeros? Uh, uh, a stream of ones and zeros in which there appears to be no pattern, right? We've got good data. We've compressed it, so we've gotten any redundancy and pattern out of, out of the data. And now we've just got a bunch of ones and zeros. There's no apparent pattern. There's no, like, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero that persists for a 1,000 bits. The ones are 50% likely, and the zeros are, of transmission are 50% likely, and Having one transmitted does not really tell you anything about any of the ones and zeros and their likelihood coming afterwards. So we would say that the bits are independent, uncorrelated to one another. And so I got this rich data stream. And I got to figure out how to put it on an RF carrier. And the first thing we got to do is that there's actually a, a recipe that describes um, how to construct a modern day digital communication system. And generally, there's three pieces of information you need to pick. So you got a data rate, and that's basically a function of what you're trying to send. What digital data are you trying to send? So there's some sort of minimal data rate that you have to maintain, whether it's video, audio, a file, internet transfers, uh, internet data. And that's going to, in turn, inform your symbol rate. I've got to pick a symbol, and I have to repeat that digital symbol at even intervals of time. And that will ultimately determine my symbol rate. Now, the symbol rate is not necessarily the same thing as the bit rate, of course. Uh, but before I pick, finalize what, how to relate my symbol rate to my bit rate, what I also need to do is pick a pulse shape. That is, the shape of a pulse that conserves frequency spectrum, that meets the spectral mask requirements of the regulatory agencies I'm dealing with that keeps signal from leaking out of bands. And we, said, we discussed several strategies for that last time. For example, we could send square wave pulses, but we know that's lousy in the frequency domain because it rings a lot. So we could, instead, we said, well, let's pick a pulse that satisfies the Nyquist inner symbol interference criterion. It's a lot more complicated to build that kind of hardware, but there are a lot of benefits because I can collect my energy such that when I modulate the signal up on an RF carrier, there's not a lot of frequency content that sprays out of band. So, for example, we could take sync pulses or something like a sync pulse, And we could modulate a one on it, right? And of course, the sync pulse crosses zero at even intervals of time. And so according to the Nyquist inner symbol interference criterion, I just need to put another sync pulse. Let's put it, give it a negative amp amplitude. We'll say that's how I am encoding a zero. And it would look something like this. It would go to... Uh, It would go to zero at all of the locations of other symbols except its own, and therefore it would not contribute to the error or to the estimate of the amplitude of the signal at that location. And that's important because we're going to now detect this signal by trying to estimate at even intervals in time what the amplitude is. We don't actually care what's going on in between. I'm going to switch to a different color. We're going to do a multimedia presentation here. If I added these two waveforms together, the aggregate signal looks something like this. 
It's some weird looking pulse that kind of goes up and goes down and there's a lot of weird stuff happening in between. But none of that matters because at the end of the day, all I care about is what is the amplitude here and what is the amplitude here? Now, to do that, to make that estimate of what the amplitude is, you can go, show, go through and show that mathematically there is an optimal way to do this. For a linear device, the, character, the characteristic that you need to make the best possible estimate, and what do I mean by best possible estimate? I mean the highest signal-to-noise ratio. So whatever additional noise is along for the ride, I'm going to maximize my signal-to-noise ratio for that particular estimate. And there's a sp special kind of uh, device that's called the matched filter for doing that. So let me go ahead and put that on the board. And keep this in mind. What does a matched filter look like? If you have a baseband signal, one that's been moved down from RF, so let's just say... And, of course, there's going to be noise here. Now, what does the matched, signal, uh, matched filter look like? So if this baseband signal is constructed from pulses, H of T, in the time domain. So H of T would be, in this case, the sync pulse, or the square wave pulse, or the triangle pulse, or the Mickey Mouse looking pulse, whatever shape that you want to apply. If that's the case, then you make this filter with an impulse response that has the exact same shape, except shifted and time reversed. So minus T, time reversed, and then T sub S is your symbol period. So what would that look like? Well, let's say if I used a triangle function. So here's T equals to zero. And this is T sub S over here. And this is minus T sub S over here. So of course, this pulse satisfies the Nyquist intersymbol interference criterion. I could use a bunch of these pulses with different amplitudes to represent the signal, the digital signal I'm, I'm making. And one pulse does not interfere with any of the amplitudes of the other pulses. Yes, John. Is that T over two? Where? Plus minus T over two, or that's just the pulse T minus T S over two. Is that, is that one period? Or that period? One, one simple period. So my next triangle would go here with whatever amplitude it had. And then my next triangle would go here. So the support is actually 2TS. Yep. And so in this case, what would I do according to this? Well, I'd time reverse it, and then I'd shift it by T sub S. So this impulse response of this system it's a symmetrical pulse in this instance, so it's really easy to time reverse. And then I shifted a pulse period, so it would look like this. This gives me a nice causal filter, right? And the estimate, the peak response, happens right there. And so then, on the output of the matched filter, I have a sampler circuit. samples the value at integer T sub S values. Because all I care about is what happens right here. This signal is going to get convolved in here. And what does the convolution of two triangle functions look like? Well, it looks something like this. If you can do this mentally, it's kind of like a curvy thing that peaks at T sub S and then drops down. In the frequency domain, this would have like sync to the fourth Fourier transform, right? 
But it looks like a, a, a quadratic rise up and then suddenly a rise down. And the peak value occurs here. And what's happening um, spectrally when we do that? Well, first of all, when I convolve with a time-reversed version, shifted version of my pulse, what that really looks like is a, a correlation, right? I'm doing a correlation with the pulse that I'm expecting compared to whatever corrupted pulse is coming in here. What's corrupting it? Noise. What type of noise? Well, it's usually additive white Gaussian noise if we've defined, divine, <coughs> designed a good RF chain, right? What's the characteristic of additive white Gaussian noise? Well, it's excitation of noise at all frequencies, all frequencies. So really what you're doing in a matched filter is you're taking a filter that has the exact same frequency profile. I mean, shifting and time reversing don't really change the frequency content, right? So whatever the Fourier transform, whatever the power spectral density of this random signal coming in, if it takes the, sim the shape of the individual pulses, I mean, this thing's going to have the exact same frequency response since you're running it through a device that has the same frequency content as your pulses. And what that means is that the parts of the signal in the frequency domain that have a lot of signal power, high SNR effectively, are going to be emphasized, and the stuff outside of band that has very low signal-to-noise ratio is going to be de-emphasized. So that's the one caveat you need to keep in, in mind when you design a match filter. This structure is optimal for the additive white Gaussian noise channel. If your noise is not Gaussian or it is not white, this is not the best detection, the best linear detector for the signal. In fact, and these come up from time to time. You find weird communications channels that aren't necessarily additive white Gaussian noise channels. For example, sometimes you have what's called colored noise. So where does colored noise come from? Well, we use the term color because uh, to, to denote uh, that the, the not all frequencies are excited uniformly. In fact, we use even colors of the rainbow, even when we're talking about RF communications, to denote the type of noise. So, for example, if your noise profile kind of slants up at high frequencies, sometimes people call that blue noise or violet noise. Because if we make the analogy to the optical signal spectrum, that's where the blue light is, the short wavelength, high frequency. Some people talk about red noise or pink noise. Uh, that's often type of, types of noise that are injected by electronics at low frequencies. For example, we talk about thermal noise. That's one source of noise that particularly concerns satellite engineers. But at low frequencies, you also get semiconductor processes that statistically inject weird noise into a signal. Um, flicker noise, for example. For anybody who studies transistors, uh, the flicker noise is caused by the statistical process where the carriers in a field effect transistor bang up against the oxide and get trapped and statistically pop back into the channel. Uh, and it tends to be additive. It tends to be Gaussian, but it tends to be have a, a low frequency profile, 1 over F or 1 over F to some power. Um, and if that's the case, if that's the type of noise corrupting your signal, this doesn't work, or it doesn't work nearly as well as it should. Instead, you do things like add a whitening filter, and then you change this characteristic accordingly, and then you do some other voodoo over here to kind of make it, make it work. So just recognize that that's the fundamental limitation of the matched filter, additive white Gaussian noise channel. Otherwise, you've got to design a different receiver to uh, do your detection. But so this thing, this here, pulls out samples every T sub S. We don't really care what's going on in between because that's not where, where the action is. We want the amplitude at that particular value. And we find that uh, this gives us the highest signal-to-noise ratio estimate at that point. Now, we'll talk later, either in this class period or on Thursday, about how to make the decisions once you get that estimate, that optimal SNR estimate. And that gets into uh, how to design a signal constellation, which is coming up. But for now, 
This will tell you the amplitude of the incoming pulse, corrupted by noise. Now, this is all nice, and the way that I've drawn it up there, we're dealing with baseband signals, but ultimately we want to put our signals on uh, an RF carrier. So to this end, let me put up on the board a generic block diagram. Black diagrams are wonderful because they gloss over a lot of details. They don't tell you exactly how you're generating the signal. But equivalently, it's a good way to think about generating the signal. The most simplest form of modulation that you can think of, one of them, is, uh, is amplitude shift keying on an RF carrier. Now, how do I do something like this? Well, I take a signal in time. And now let's say I'm going to use circle hump pulses. It's a terrible pulse to use, but it's really good for board illustration, right? Let's say... I've got my first pulse at time equals to zero. My second pulse at time, let's do it like this. Yeah. Second pulse at time equal to T sub S. Third pulse, two sub S, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm choosing a scheme now where I'm going to multi, I'm going to, place digital bits onto this pulse by encoding it onto the amplitude. So this high pulse at this level is going to be a 1, and this little pulse is going to be a 0. And that's how I would transmit 101. Very easy waveform to conceptualize in the time domain at baseband. Now we have to put it up at RF, or what we would call passband. So I take that signal and I run it into a mixer, an RF mixer. A mixer basically just multiplies. It's made out of diodes. You can buy them at mini circuits or wherever. Throw it in your device, hook it up with cables, or put it on a surface mount uh, using surface mount components, put it on a PCB. And it's a three-port device. You put in your baseband. You put in your local oscillator, which is another device. It's essentially cosine 2 pi FCT, your carrier. And then you send it out. And this is basically, at this point, what you could send through your antenna. You may want to put a power amplifier after that. But for the most part, from an analysis point of view, we'll just keep it simple and, and make it like this. This guy moves the signal. This will have a power spectral density. It looks like this at baseband. It modulates this up to a carrier frequency. So now, this is my carrier, F sub C and minus F sub C in the Fourier transform domain. And I've now placed my signal up at those carriers. I send it out, my antenna. The world's simplest modulation scheme, generic amplitude shift keying. If you make this amplitude zero, that's when you have on-off keying. That's a simple, a special case of ASK. If you make this a negative one, where now you're sending negative hump, hump pulses, this with the same amplitude, just the phase changed, we call that binary phase shift keying, another simple variant of amplitude shift keying. <clears throat> And most of this you probably already understand. However, one has to recognize that at RF, on a carrier, we, if you just limit yourself to this paradigm of amplitude shift keying, you are wasting 50% of your information carrying capacity. Now, why is that? So at baseband... This signal has a baseband bandwidth of B. 
right? And because of the Fourier transform, the positive and the negative side of this frequency spectrum both exist, and they both should be bandwidth B. But of course, we, we know that you can really just pay attention to the positive frequency domain, and that really tells you where your spectral occupancy is. If it's a real valued signal, the negative side has to be the complex mirror image of the positive side. So there's, for a real signal, communication signal, for example, this is always redundant information on the left-hand side. <coughs> However, when I move this up to a carrier, now the signal op occupies 2B in the frequency domain, 2B on the positive side and 2B on the negative side. But I said that this left-hand part of the signal is redundant because we know it's a real-valued signal. So... We know that something's going on here. And to make a long story short, what we're missing is the fact that I actually have at RF a separate additional channel that I can do. I can put spectrum right on top of this and have it be completely separable to the data that I've already put on there. without any loss. And the way to do this mathematically is that I run the carrier through a 90 degree phase shift to make a sine pi FC of T, get another mixer, get a separate ASK signal through here, <coughs> mix this up, and add it. This channel of information is called your in-phase channel in RF. This channel is called your quadrature channel. And any good digital communication system will use both of those simultaneously because you can get basically twice the information through a limited bandwidth. Now, how does this work in practice? To really understand it, how would you decode this? Well, again, I'll draw the doc block diagram, mathematical way you decode it. In practice, you do something a little bit different. But this is generally at least demonstrates how separable the channels are. If I take this exact same structure a local oscillator at 2 pi FCT again shift it so that it's a sine wave I split the channel up and I mix both of these down so Keep in mind, I've got two signals on a carrier here. If I run this through a cosine or a sine, that's going to move copies of the signal up F sub T and down F sub T, which means at this point I've got frequency contact at twice the carrier frequency and at baseband. So I need to apply a low-pass filter to recover the baseband component, get rid of all that high-frequency stuff. And again, I'm glossing over a tremendous amount of RF engineering, some of which we already understand in this class. There's going to be low noise amplifiers and filters. I may even move this down uh, in several steps. I may just move this to an intermediate frequency, mix it down to an intermediate frequency, do some more filtering and amplification before moving it down to baseband. Or at that point, I might even run it straight into an A to D and do all of these mathematical operations in signal processing in the digital domain with a DSP or an FPGA or my own custom chip that I've designed for signal processing. <coughs> As I said, lots of stuff is being glossed over here. But the point is, by drawing the, di the diagram like this, you can start to see how these channels are separable. I have a cosine 2 pi FCT my cosine channel is going to come in through here. My in-phase channel is going to come in through here. 
Cosine times cosine is basically one half. This is cosine squared coming out of this mixer. If you remember your trig identities, that's a DC component. That's your low frequency component. Plus your component that's twice the frequency, 4 pi FCT. And this is the one that gets knocked out in the low pass filter. So I get something that's going to be proportional to my in phase channel, whatever I transmit it over here. I'll call it x sub i of t. My quadrature channel, which was multiplied by a sine wave, now comes in and gets multiplied again by a cosine wave, cosine of 2 pi f t times sine of 2 pi f t. Let's put our carrier frequency there, just to denote that's the carrier. Well, what's that identity equal to? What do you get? <coughs> oh, pardon me. Yeah, twice the frequency. A sine wave that's twice the frequency. Exactly. Love a, love a guy who knows his trig tables in his head. This is going to be sine of 4 pi FCT. It'll be proportional to that. So since you only have content up at 4 pi, uh, basically twice the carrier frequency, that, that's not going to make it through at all. And so you can see that this is completely separable. In phase makes it through, quadrature does not. If I work through similar math, math I would find ideally in this idealized block diagram structure, the quadrature makes it through, the in phase does not make it through on that channel. And keep in mind that these signals are occupying the exact same frequency spectrum. It's a unique characteristic of a passband or an RF channel, not a baseband channel. Uh, and this allows you to do a lot of interesting things. So for example, some people in the days of analog communications, they would run this signal. They would just do this modulation, real channel in phase uh, modulation. But they would cut. They would run this through something called a single sideband filter. And they would cut either the lower end or the higher end of the signal spectrum out. That was single sideband modulation. You could still put Humpty back together again when you mix down using this exact same channel structure. You just basically glue the two signal spectra back together. But at RF, your signal took half the bandwidth that it did um, at baseband. Right? Does everybody see that? So that was a signal, single sideband. Um, you could do upper sideband. You could keep the upper sideband or the lower sideband, whatever your fancy was. There's another form of sideband modulation called vestigial sideband. The thinking was, well, I can't make a perfect filter to notch this sucker out at RF. And so I will instead allow a little bit of the sideband to leak through on the top and the bottom. That's how analog, digital, uh, analog television worked. And so you could use a realistic filter, but you'd still be conserving bandwidth. You just have to, it's called vestigial sideband because that piece of spectrum sticking out was kind of a vestigial component. You know the term vestigial, like a vestigial organ? Your appendix is a vestigial organ. You don't really need it. You can, get, you can live without it. But it's there, taking up space. Right? Same, same word, same concept. Okay. So we've established that we have an in-phase and a quadrature channel in a digital RF communication system. And we can take advantage of that. Because what this means is we can do amplitude shift keying simultaneously on two different channels and still be able to decode it. Now, how would you represent the, a, a system that was doing this more complicated form of symbol manipulation on in-phase and quadrature channels simultaneously. Well, to do this, you introduce a concept in digital communications called a constellation diagram. 
And here you make a 2D plot. Your horizontal axis is in phase. I'll label that I. And your quadrature channel is Q. That's in the vertical axis. <clears throat> and typically your pulses are aligned. So you're sending a, some sort of pulse shape in the in phase, and it has an amplitude. And you would graph that amplitude on the horizontal axis. And your quadrature channel would have some sort of amplitude. You graph that on the vertical axis accordingly. And so each, every combination of symbol that you can send on in phase and quadrature, you can represent as a dot. And the collection of dots we call a constellation, just like a grouping of stars, your signal constellation. It doesn't tell you anything about how many symbols per second you're s sending and what pulse shape you're using. There's an infinite number of communication systems that can have the same signal constellation. So it doesn't specify your modulation, but it's a pretty critical component of, what's, uh, of uh, how to specify what modulation scheme you're using and ultimately what data rate that you can support. Because the way I've drawn it here, now I've got four points, right? I am, I'm sending essentially two bits per symbol period. I could have a, this represent two bits, this represent two bits, this represents two bits, this represents two bits. One, 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 zero, 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 and zero, one, for example. And this has a special, this particular uh, constellation, we would call quadrature phase <coughs> shift keying. Let me go ahead and assign some bits to it. Let's call that one zero, I'll call this one one, I'll call this zero zero, and I'll call this zero one. Let me go over to this diagram over here. Let me, using square pulses, illustrate how this would look like. I would either send high or low values, each symbol period. So I have, here I have an example of four symbol periods, both in in phase and quadrature. And according to the diagram that I just put on the board, if I have a positive in phase and a positive quadrature channel, in this slot I would be sending one zero. And if I had a negative quadrature amplitude and a positive quadrature, uh, excuse me, negative in phase, positive quadrature, negative in phase, positive quadrature, we called that zero zero in our previous diagram. And here, I've got positive in phase, negative quadrature. We called that 1, 1. And negative, negative is 0, 1. So here, in four symbol periods, I've sent eight bits. I can double the bit rate by using that quadrature channel effectively. And this is a really easy scheme to implement in hardware. Quadrature phase shifting, extremely simple. Any questions before we keep discussing this? Everybody's tracking my notation and concepts. Yeah, straightforward stuff, straightforward stuff. Now, when I look over at the constellation diagram, I, I didn't just pick those values willy-nilly. There's an additional, there, there are really two things to report in the signal constellation. There's the constellation points themselves which is probably primarily going to influence things like bit error rate and how reliable your system's going to be. 
However, I also have to specify bit assignments. And bit assignments aren't willy-nilly in these diagrams. Even as in a simple signal constellation like this, the way that I did it, my, the assignments that I made were actually, I could have done this, for example. And this is actually an inferior way to assign bits for this particular signal constellation. Would anybody like to explain why? I just flipped two bit assignments. Ah, yeah, Nick. Switch from uh, each section. You were only doing one bit. So that's, it's code. that's right. Yeah. It, that's right. The previous one was uh, not by accident, not this time anyway, gray coded by the instructor when he drew the diagram. What does that mean? That means that the most likely errors, the adjacent binary sequences, the ones that are next door, are only differing by one bit. So, for example, if I'm, I'm, if I'm here, if I transmit this, but my signal is corrupted with noise, well, what that means is that I've got a center point and there's going to be some Gaussian noise, both in, in phase and quadrature, that's going to push my estimate away from that. How do I detect this system? Well, I've got to draw something called a decision boundary, in both I and Q and say, come up with a rule. It says, well, anything that falls in this quadrant, I'm going to snap to that point. And anything that falls in this quadrant, I'm going to snap to that point, et cetera, et cetera. So if I have a point here that was transmitted with corrupting noise, it's going to push me to one of three different quadrants. Because now I have a more complicated signal constellation, not all quadrants are as likely as the other. In other words, my most likely errors are going to be to the adjacent quadrants. If I make an error this way, I lose only one bit. In fact, in the previous scheme, when I had 0, 1, and 1, 1, you see that all of the adjacent errors only differ by one bit from one another. That's not true of the previous one I had, where you could go to an adjacent region and make two bit errors. It seems like a small thing, but it adds up over time and creates a bit error. So in terms of reliable transmission, you always want to gray code your sig signal constellation. That becomes very challenging when you get really complicated signal constellations. <coughs> but there are lots of papers and references for doing that. This is an old problem in communications. So quadrature phase shift keying, you will give it, there are four, in standard QPSK, there are four points, and you have to give basically two-bit bit assignments to each of them. And now, there are several flavors of QPSK. Run-of-the-mill QPSK actually has this signal constellation. This is another variation of QPSK. where you have a positive voltage on your in-phase and nothing on your quadrature, or a negative voltage on your in-phase and nothing on your quadrature, and vice versa. From a reliability point of view, identical to what we just drew on the board, for the same average signal power, it would perform identically. It may be easier to build one version of QPSK versus the other. This version of QPSK is generally considered normal or regular, I should say, quadrature phase shift keying. When you take the signal constellation and rotate it 90 degrees or 45 degrees, pi over 4 radians, we call that pi over 4 QPSK. Why do you prefer one over the other? It may just come down to implementation. I think people like the idea of drawing your signal boundaries along the axes of I and Q. It makes the comparison simple. Whereas for this particular, for regular QPSK, my decision, decision boundaries are lines in IQ space. So it's a little harder to decode, uh, to code up in hardware 
the decision rule for that constellation. <clears throat> There's another form of quadrature phase shift keying. And that's D QPSK. D stands for differential. That's where the binary sequences are encoded not in absolute constellations, but rather based on the relative transitions between symbols. So, for example, you don't say, let me draw Q, pi over 4 QPSK here. You don't say this bit is always 0, 0, this is always 1, 0, this is always 0, 1, this is always 1, 1. Instead, you transmit a pulse, and the value of bits that you're transmitting digitally depends on the previous value. It's always relative to the phase of the previous transmitted symbol. So if you advance 90 degrees, then we'll call that a 1, 0. If you advance... 180 degrees, we'll call that a 1-1. One, one. If you advance 270 degrees, we'll call that a 0-1. And if you go back to your own phase, advance 0 degrees, we'll call that a 0-0. Zero, zero. So each transmission is relative to the previous. Why is that a good way to code things? Well, there's a, a problem that my idealized block diagram has glossed over in a radio communication link. Let's go back to this diagram and take a look at this thing. I've got a local oscillator with a specified carrier frequency. The only way my receiver structure works in this idealized block diagram approach is if I have an exact copy of the local oscillator here that transmits at FC. If it is a little bit off, even a mil, uh, one hertz or 0.1 hertz, some tiny fraction of a hertz. Over time, what that means is that effectively my signal constellation rotates in phase space. What started off as a nice pi over 4 quadrature phase shift keying starts to slip. And at some point, my, my in phase and quadrature channels flip. Portion of this one starts showing up here. Portion of this one starts showing up here. At some point, they're going to flip, and then they're going to flip back. They're going to flip back. And the oscillation of that flipping is going to be basically the difference between the frequencies in the two oscillators. How good are our oscillators nowadays? Well, if you think about it, time in electrical engineering is one of the few things, it might be the only thing, that we as electrical engineers have been control over to an almost limitless and arbitrary level of precision. Timekeeping is what electrical engineer, engineering is really about, right? That's really what we can measure very precisely. We have these ridiculously accurate clocks that are like atomic clocks, the ones out at NIST, for example, that you know, I don't know how, you know, they, they do like 10 to the minus 20-something se seconds or, or beyond. I think there's a clock there that will slip a second every, I don't know, millennia. It's just some ridiculous number like that. Or, or it might even be like you have to go back into dinosaur times before you, that much time would have to elapse to slip a second on this clock. It's amazing. It's amazing. Now, most of us that do wireless communications do not have timekeeping in our phones that are nearly that sophisticated. But they've come a long way. They use things like quartz, temperature-controlled quartz oscillators <coughs> and some other frequency standards that have become very low cost and can usually reproduce an oscillator in one part per 10 million. If you're lucky, one part per 100 million if you've got a really, really nice frequency standard. But for consumer electronics, that's usually the best you can do. So what does that mean, one part per 10 million? If your carrier frequency is 1 gigahertz, Divide by 10 million, 100 hertz. That's pretty much going to be the difference. So you pull two oscillators that are allegedly operating at 1 gigahertz each. You stick them in two different phones or two different receiver and a transmitter. Ultimately, you can expect about 100 hertz of difference 
as a standard deviation in either direction, positive or negative, between the two. So you can see that this problem actually compounds as you start going up in carrier frequency. When you get up to satellite frequencies that are in the millimeter waves regime, let's say we're operating at 50 gigahertz, well, now that one part per 10 million means that you are going to be, what is it, 5,000 hertz off. That's significant. That means your constellation is going to be spinning around 5,000 times per second. Now, the good news is that at those time scales, even thousands of times per second is not a big deal for a modern-day communication system because you can still send thousands of bits or at least hundreds of bits before you notice any of that rotation. The time scale is off. It seems fast to us from our macroscopic perspective, 5,000 revolutions per second. But in terms of what it takes to transmit a bit, which is occurring on the nanosecond scale in a modern-day communication system, the thing looks like it's essentially static for a few hundred bits. Even if it was a few dozen bits, it's still not a problem. So you can overcome this rotation issue by always referencing your decoding and your encoding from the previous symbol. And that way, by, by looking at relative jumps, if there is phase rotation in your signal constellation, it, it will not matter over time. It will slowly calibrate out. This was a particularly popular way to deal with communications in the early days, especially before, like, in the 60s, early 70s, and 50s, when frequency standards were really crummy. We didn't have widespread uh, quartz oscillators for radios and, and the like. So, <coughs> this idea of relative jumping essentially fixes that, and that's called differential quadrature phase shift keying. You can also do differential binary phase shift keying. You add the D in front of anything to make it differential, and that's a nice way to handle things. In fact, some receivers, instead of actually demodulating in phase and quadrature channels and trying to estimate where the phase is and estimating the relative phase offset, they will simply correlate the previous, their current symbol with the previous symbol. They'll actually use the previous symbol as the matched filter effectively for the next symbol. That adds in some extra noise, but makes for a really easy seat receiver to design. In fact, you don't even need to know exactly what your pulse shape is to do something like that. Very simple receiver. Okay. So that's quadrature phase shift keying. Any questions so far? Okay. So then, now let's go to the next level. and talk about even more complicated forms of digital modulation, which we have the freedom to use in satellite engineering. say so in previous digital modulation schemes what was going on on each channel was relatively simple. I was just basically sending a binary signal. I was turning a pulse amplitude on or off, or I was inverting the phase of the pulse symbol. However, if I want to, I can send uh, a pulse that had a multiplicity of levels in amplitude to pick out of. For example, instead of going 
positive 1 or negative 1. I could do mm, positive voltage, negative voltage, positive a third of a voltage, negative a third of a voltage. That would give me four different amplitudes that my pulse could have. And if I could do that, then that means I would be able to send two bits per pulse. And if I'm using an in-phase and quadrature channel simultaneously, I could send four bits per pulse. And in fact, I could play this game for quite a while. I can have dozens of levels, hundreds of levels for each pulse. Use it in conjunction with an in-phase and quadrature channel. And uh, I could send quite a few bits per symbol. I like that because it doesn't require any additional bandwidth because I haven't changed the shape of my pulse or the rate of the symbols. I'm just adding extra bits per symbol transmitted. Now, of course, there's a trade-off. I can only do these what's called higher order modulation schemes when my RF channel is relatively clean. If I start to, if I have a lot of RF noise, then I'm going to start disturbing my, my uh, signal constellation to the point where I can't decode it. We'll see that in a second when I sketch it out. But one such higher order modulation scheme is called MRE phase shift keying. In this instance, the signal constellation looks like this. I got an I, I got a Q, and now let's say that I transmit a signal like this. All these points that I draw rest on a circle. And that's important because the distance from the center represents the amplitude of the pulse in absolute terms. Remember, you always have to translate this behavior to what's actually going on in a physical carrier. What's the physical signal that's coming out of my antenna? Well, I've got symbols that are modulated onto a carrier, and if I have a combination of an in-phase and a quadrature symbol, then what I'm actually transmitting is a single symbol with some offset in phase of the carrier that's carrying it, right? So if I put a square symbol on the in-phase channel, I got a cosine. If I put a square wave symbol on a sine wave, I got a sine. If I put two square waves of the same amplitude on the in phase and the quadrature, when those add up and get on the antenna, it's basically good, just going to look like a cosine plus 45 degrees. And so by dialing in the different amplitudes of in phase and quadrature, I'm really just changing the phase of the carrier. The distance of the point from the center to that point is really the total amplitude of the symbol on the carrier. It basically tells me how big my carrier is going to have to be to carry the symbol. So if they're all on a circle like this, what that means is every single symbol has the exact same power level as, as one another. And I can assign bits here. In this case, I've got eight symbols in my sketch. I could call this 111, 110, 010, uh, et cetera, gray coded around. How would I transmit something like this? Well, effectively, what I would have to do, I would define different bits. And if I wanted to transmit th this one, I've got a little bit of in phase and a lot of quadrature. If I want to transmit this bit combination over here, I got a, a big negative in phase and a slightly positive quadrature. I want to transmit this one over here. I got a negative, a uh, little slightly positive in phase. See this one over here, slightly positive in phase, big negative quadrature. And so you can see I can construct. This is the, the building blocks of how you would make a signal with a constellation like this. I take two symbol streams vary the amplitudes according to this chart and in phase and quadrature, mix them on cosine and sine, and then add them up. OK. That's m airy phase shift keying. This would be a, an example of what we would call 8 airy phase shift keying, the one that I've sketched on the board. Now, of course, you can go higher. You could do 16 airy 
phase shift keying. 32 area phase shift keying. 64 area phase shift keying. In this instance, if I go to higher order schemes, each of these constellation points are getting closer and closer together. Now, at some point, I'm going to have to decode this signal, which means I've got to draw decision boundaries. The decision boundaries uh, on a phase shift keying diagram look like a pizza. Slice it up with like a pizza and just say, let my phase points fall in the middle of the slice of the pizza. Very simple. Okay. Now, phase shift keying is really attractive because there's one unattractive thing about it, right? If I make the pizza slices smaller and smaller and smaller, then a little bit of noise is likely to disturb the situation dramatically. It'll push the decision point very easily into the next pizza slice if I try to decode that. So there's only so much I can do with phase shift keying. It has to be a very clean RF channel. There's a reason why satellite engineers like phase shift keying, though, because <coughs> all the symbols have the same power. So if your transmit amplifier is, going, is being driven very hard, it's being close to its upper limit, and you're clipping a little bit, not a big deal. It does not change the phase, uh, the uh, de decision boundaries in your transmitted waveform. Why is that? Well, because the, the information is encoded entirely on the phase. When that signal goes through an amplifier, what does an amplifier do when you start to drive it really hard? Well, it starts to clip, right? You can't, you can't reach its maximum voltage swing. That's going to start to introduce some distortion. There are other forms of higher order modulation, the one I'll put up in a second, quadrature amplitude modulation, where if I start clipping it, that means I start squishing the outer limits of the, of the signal constellation inward on the IQ diagram. And that will push some points into the bound decision boundaries, past the decision boundaries of other points. If they don't go past the decision boundaries, at least they get a lot closer, and it becomes very easy to make an error. I don't have this with uh, MRA phase shift keying because if I squish all these points together, the decision boundaries still don't change. It still looks like a pizza. And so I'm safe. That's a very attractive um, aspect of MRA phase shift keying. So we do use this in satellite engineering. Ah, yeah. Changing the amplitude, the, the amplitude of the signal? Uh, the total amplitude of the signal that comes out here which is where your, your power amplifier would be, does not change for each of these points. For these individual streams, though, they are, they are different. Yep. So MRE phase shift keying, that's one example of how to send data bits. Another form of higher order modulation would be MRE quadrature. Amplitude modulation. For short, this is often called MQAM, or just QAM. The M is the number of points in your, in your signal constellation. So for example, let me draw here would be the signal constellation for 16 qualm transmission. And I would basically have a, a waveform that would have four different possible levels in in phase. Four different possible levels in quadrature. And then the combinations of those two would give me 16 possible complex signals. 
We say complex because we often represent this, these points as a complex number both, that has both amplitude and phase. So you represent 16 different points on the signal diagram. That means I could transmit up to four bits per symbol on this type of communication scheme. And this is better in terms of performance, theoretically, than phase shift keying. Because for the same 16 area phase shift keying, <coughs> I've got to put 16 points all in a circle. On average, those points are going to be much closer together than if I spread them out in the IQ diagram. So for that reason, I find myself preferring QAM in terms of overall performance. The only problem is there's a trade-off. If I run this signal through a power amplifier that's exhibiting some nonlinear properties, it's you know, starting to clip, it's starting to compress the really high amplitude signals that are going through it, that means that these outer points are going to start to get squished inward. Where do I draw the decision boundaries for a QAM signal? Well, for this type of rectangular point where I've laid out everything on a grid, usually the simplest and preferred technique is to just draw everything into grids, divide it into a grid in between all the points and say, here's my decision boundaries. Well, now all of a sudden I've got a nonlinear amplifier, which at first starts to push these corner points inward. And if it starts to go really nonlinear, these outer other points will also be affected and start getting collected inward. And my signal detectability goes down. You now, of course, there's always uh, somebody says, well, if your power amplifier is starting to go nonlinear, just put a better power amplifier in there. It's a satellite radio. It's going to you're going to spend millions of dollars on this piece of hardware anyway. Don't be cheap. Put a high-powered amplifier in there. What's the trade-off for that? Anybody taking a microwaves class, a microwave design lab here, studied some power amplifiers? Why can't you just put an arbitrarily large power amp on your spacecraft, or any radio for that matter? Efficiency. Oh, yeah, that's the magic word. Who said that? Oh, good, good. That's right. In, there's a trade-off in these uh, systems. If you want a power amplifier that's capable of pr having a nice linear response to reproduce this over the dynamic range of your signal, for the same given tr average power of the signal, you are going to have to consume more DC power. <coughs> your power level becomes inefficient. If you want a really nice amplifier, you, you're talking about power efficiencies of less than 25% here if you're not willing to accept any distortion. That power level, the efficiency can go up to 80% or even higher if you are allowed to tolerate some distortion in your amplifier. That's a big difference. And when watts are at a premium as they are in a spacecraft, that's something you need to pay attention to. So when you spec out your power requirements for your cube set, for example, you're going to have to figure out what modulation scheme you're going to use. You're going to be tempted to use 1,024 qualm. You say, look, I've got the signal-to-noise ratio to prove it. Ah, but what's the power requirement on your amplifier? How much power do you need to put into your antenna? It's not the same as how much power is your communication system actually using. You may be only using one watt, but for the constellation that you've, you've got one watt into the antenna, for the constellation that you need and the linearity and the dynamic range that you're required, your amplifier may need five watts or you know, 10 watts versus five, 50 watts. The watts add up quickly when you're only given a small solar cell in space to drive the transmission. So keep that in mind when you go to design your communication link and specify what your RF hardware has to look like. The power into the transmit antenna is not the power required by your transmitter. The power required by your transmitter is usually, in a well-designed RF link, two to three times more than what you require. 
than what the antenna will accept. Four or five times or more if you're really trying to use a system that has high fidelity, like a, a quadrature amplitude modulation system. Okay. <clears throat> Let's do a quick example. How, how would, what kind of question could I ask on a test regarding this? Here's a question. A digital alien signal is received from outer space. And looking at the signal constellation, you find that they are using the following transmission format. They're using trapezoidal pulses And this peculiar four-state signal constellation. So the question then asks, make a rough sketch in the diagram below, which I'll draw, of the transmission of data sequence 1000011 in alien. And so your diagram below looks like this. I've got two axes with four symbol periods each on top of each other. This is your in phase channel. This is your quadrature channel. These signals are then being mixed up to an RF carrier and then transmitted via a transmit antenna, both in phase and quadrature. So what are the signals you should feed your in-phase and quadrature channel at this point? Okay, I've got trapezoids. For some reasons, these aliens are using trapezoids. It's a science fiction television type modulation, but I won't mind that. Okay, I got my trapezoids. What am I going to send first? My first transmitted bit is one zero. I look at the signal constellation. I find a one zero is actually a positive in phase trapezoid and a slightly negative quadrature trapezoid. My next symbol is zero, zero. Oh, that's easy. I just put zero on each. And let's see, the next thing I transmit is a zero, one, one, zero, 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 one. That's going to be a negative in phase and a slightly negative quadrature channel, trapezoid. And then finally, 1-1, one, one, that's going to be a zero in phase and a large positive trapezoid in my quadrature channel. <clears throat> 
And so I feed these waveforms into this structure. Out pops a carrier with these complex symbols modulated on top of it. Trapezoids of various phase offsets. And presumably I can now send symbol signals back to planet X, wherever this is coming from. <clears throat> is this a more advanced technology, technology than what we transmit with? No, it seems these aliens need a lesson in communications, especially pulse shaping. Trapezoids, really? But it looks cool, doesn't it? I'd say this would be a good waveform for uh, TV modulation, a, a TV sci-fi show. Okay, any other questions so far? Well, this is a whirlwind tour of digital modulation. The only one we didn't cover, the one that kind of defies characterization by the scheme of signal constellation, pulse shape, and, and symbol rate, these three ingredients that I use to specify what could be an infinite number of modulation schemes. Uh, one that's related, and you should be aware of, is MRE frequency shift keying, MRE FSK. It's a digital modulation scheme where instead of sending the same symbol with different amplitudes and phases, we're sending different frequency components. So you can represent this one way in a block diagram is... to get an, a bank of M oscillators. Different RF oscillators. And simply select one depending on which bit, which bit you're sem sending or which combination of bits you're sending for a symbol period. So if I wanted simply to send, transmit binary FSK, I just have two oscillators. One here, one here. And I flip back between them. When I want to send a 1, I go to this one. I want to send a 0, go to that one. And at the, the rate at which I switch plus the distance between those oscillators is going to determine ultimately my signal bandwidth. Ultimately, I don't have any additional information carrying capacity using FSK as opposed to binary phase shift keying or phase shift keying, QAM, MRE, PSK. It's just a different way to organize the, um, the information. This technique usually has the benefit, like PSK, like phase shift keying, that uh, it's resistant to amplifier nonlinearities. If you think about coding information in terms of frequency, you're really counting the level crossings. And that doesn't change if you start clipping your signal. So if you want a cheap amplifier or you want to be very power efficient, you can use this type of uh, scheme. And again, you can play games call this 000, the state 001, the state 010, and have you know, eight different oscillators that you're selecting from. This allows you to send more bits per FM or frequency modulating symbol. Otherwise, it's identical in concept to these other modulation schemes that we've studied. Now, hopefully we have time for this. Any questions before we jump into I think I would like to break out my laptop if we have time. Well, no, we don't have time. We have about seven. I'll, I'll just continue in this manner. We'll start the next lecture with some diagrams that illustrate this. So I don't want to lose time setting up the projector. For satellite video broadcasts, 
does that typically look like? Well, nowadays, they're almost exclusively MPEG version 4 encoded. There may be a few legacy MPEG 2s and even analogs, but for video, digital video broadcasts, MPEG 4 is the encoding. And in satellite engineering, we usually use low-order modulation schemes. We do more than binary phase shifting because we want to make good use of our signal spectrum. Transmit multiple bits per symbol. However, we can't do systems that you could do in uh, terrestrial or even wired links where you could send maybe 1,024 qualm or something ridiculous like that. So, for example, uh, I don't know, does anybody remember using a dial-up modem? Those, those uh, they used to modulate symbols on carriers in a dial-up modem when you're sending data to and back on the, to and fro on the phone line. Those used to have like 1,024, 2,048, even 4,096 uh, qualm on what is effectively audio carriers on there. Why? Because they had a nice clean channel. They could decode very easily. Because of the large link losses in satellite links, we can't do ridiculously high order modulation. You're be, at some points, you're fortunate to get much more than QPSK because there's just the, the links, there's just not enough signal energy there. If there were, you'd have to put a tremendous amount of hardware in space to get it to achieve that. So satellite links are typically low order modulation. We're talking QPSK, 8 area phase shift keying, or low order QAM. When I say low order, I mean like six, 16 QAM, something like that. And the really interesting thing, I'll bring in a graph next class period we'll talk about, is that we often put adjustability In other words, you can change mid-transmission your protocol and your constellation diagram depending on what the channel conditions are. So if it's a nice sunny day, no clouds in the sky, no rain, you're operating a high-frequency satellite link, you transmit at 16 qualm. You've got a nice signal-to-noise ratio. All of a sudden, a rainstorm comes, and you start to lose 2 or 3 dB off your link. You can't decode quadrature amplitude modulation anymore. Now you switch to 8 area PSK. And if the signal degrades a little bit further, you go down to QAM, uh, QPSK, quadrature phase shift keying. That's only two bits per symbol. And if you get really desperate, you just go straight to binary phase shift keying. So I'll give you an example when we start um, class on Thursday of a signal constellation that was designed for satellite communications that this is not actually quite QAM and it's not quite PSK. It has some interesting characteristics of both, and it's adjustable depending on the signal-to-noise ratio in order to squeeze every last possible drop of, of uh, sensitivity and bit rate out of your link. Now, there's one more thing that we'll talk about on Thursday that we haven't yet, and this is the missing component, and that is error correction. Most satellite links use something called BCH forward error correction. or low density parity check codes. And this last step is something that needs, we need to add in to boost our transmission reliability. We talked about compression where you take a digital signal and you ring out every last extra superfluous bit out of the signal to compress it so that it will fit in the bandwidth of your wireless channel, regardless of the, the you know, there's this all, a whole aspect of symbol shape and constellation design 
simple rate. But ultimately, it be, the, it's easier to hit your spectral mass criterion when you've shortened your bit rate. So we wring every last bit of redundancy out of the bit stream. And then what we'll do on Thursday as our last crowning achievement in digital communications, we're going to add extra bits. And that just makes it more difficult to meet my spectral criteria. But if we add the redundancy in a special way, it allows us to transmit over an unreliable medium like the wireless channel. You can actually undo some of the damage that the wireless channel does. You can actually detect some bits wrong, and it actually doesn't hurt your data sy uh, symbol or data stream. You can recover all the necessary information you need. That's actually a really neat concept. And it's fairly intuitive how it works, but we'll need to, to talk about the different types of error correction codes available to us nowadays, how to spec them. What is it about an error correction code that gives us resiliency and the ability to correct errors? These are two types of codes, uh, block codes, in fact, that uh, are available to us. And we'll talk about block codes and convolutional codes and turbo codes. Well, let's go ahead and finish off our units on digital modulation. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to switch over to the projector, and we'll finish up a few slides related to what we talked about last time, which is digital modulation. And here, just to summarize, what do satellite video broadcasts consist of? Well, now they're mostly MPEG-4 encoded video. That's the type of encoding that's used. Not so much MPEG-2 anymore. This is an old slide. Low order modulation. That's modulation where I'm sending more than one bit per symbol, but I'm not many more than one bit per symbol. Why? Because that's the luxury of uh, a radio link that has a lot of excess power, it has a lot of excess margin using things like uh, 256 QAM or uh, 128 ARI phase shift keying. Those are higher order constellations that we typically cannot support in satellite engineering just because we don't have enough link margin. That means we'd have to have extra transmit power, bigger solar panels. That's more weight on the spacecraft. That adds a couple mil to the launch costs. And at the end of the day, it's just not worth it at some point. Um, and the key point there that I'll show you on the next graph is that this, a lot of these lower order modulation schemes are adjustable depending on the signal to noise ratio. For video, the video fits in about 36 megahertz channels. And it's, uh, there, there's this adaptive modulation scheme built into it. Maybe 20 years ago, 25 years ago, um, there were some people that started to do di adaptive digital modulation. The idea is that this, the channel does not always stay the same. In satellite communications, it fades some. In mobile communications on Earth, it fades a lot. And so um, one of the pioneers of, of this field is actually my old postdoc advisor, a guy named Professor Sei Chisampe from Osaka University. He built some of the first adaptive modulators when he was at the communications research lab before he became a professor. It's actually pretty slick. You know, you sound the channel out, you figure out what your signal and noise ratio, and you change your constellation based on the quality of the channel. That way you're always maximizing the number of bits per second that you can send on the radio link. And then we would, this means nothing to us at the moment, but it uses BCH forward error correction coding and low density parity check codes either one of those. We'll understand what that means in a second. Here's an example, however, of that adaptive modulation. The axes are kind of difficult to read, so I'll go ahead and read them for you. We have signal-to-noise ratio. That dark line is 0 dB SNR, all the way up to 16 dB on the right-hand side. And this is basically uh, how much throughput you're getting through the wireless channel on a satellite link, depending on different constellations and types of coding that's being used. So on the horizontal, on the vertical axis is spectrum efficiency. It's usually bits per hertz or some unit like that. I believe this is in bits per hertz, even though 
this particular student, whoever this was, I ripped this off online, was a lousy student and did not label the uh, units on his axes. <clears throat> but anyway, this is a, a spectrum efficiency. How well are you using your spectrum? Now, look at, as you go up the line, first of all, zero dB SNR. That's a really crummy SNR, isn't it? That means I have the same amount of RF power as I do noise power. You can still do communications in that. And I haven't really told you how to do that yet. But uh, down here at low, low SNR, you're just using binary phase shift keying. You can see a sketch of the signal constellation down there. That circle, which represents e equidistant from the center or the, the origin of an IQ plot. They don't actually have the IQ axes like I've been drawing on the board. But just a circle to denote constant power and two points on the signal constellation. So that circle actually is, is a kind of average power. Now, as the signal-to-noise ratio goes up and I can pack in more signal constellation points, you see at some point I, I change my coding around to get more spectrum efficiency, and then at some point here I hit QPSK. In fact, this is pi over 4 quadrature phase shift keying, four points equidistant around a constant transmit power ring, and I would draw my decision boundaries at, at the detector in between all those four points to make sort of like four pizza slices in my detector. And I can transmit twice as many bits per second. And then, of course, you'll see some, there's some graded bits per second in between here. You'll notice that there, we, went, we, we switched from binary phase shift keying to quadrature phase shift keying, but there are some points in between, and what they're doing is changing the amount of redundancy in their forward error correction code to get more spectrum efficiency. They're backing off on the redundancy as the SNR improves. And then at some point it improves so much they can just use a higher constellation point. So you see then it progresses up to, ah, the next constellation change occurs somewhere around 7 dB. And we switch over to 8 area phase shift keying. Do you see these eight points equidistant around a circle? Here at about in the middle of the graph. Right there. You see that? That's 8 area PSK. Then something interesting happens up at 11 uh, dB of signal to noise ratio. At this point, the constellation bifurcates here. We've got two rings, two rings to, to place points. I've got four points around the middle, and then eight points, uh, excuse me, no, 12 points around the outer ring. 12 plus 4 is 16. I can now send four bits per symbol with this signal constellation. But it doesn't exactly resemble any of the canonical modulation types we talked about last class period. It's not phase shift keying because I've got two different amplitudes at work in my signal. But I, it's not qualm either, not, not that grid-like qualm that I'm, I discussed last time where you had four by four pixels uh, or, or, or points on my Quam constellation. And this constellation is designed in such a way to, to try to give you the best of both the worlds. We said if you put everything around a ring, then the points get too close together and a little bit of noise can distort significantly your detection. So that's why phase shift keying wasn't good. But phase shift keying is very good because if there are some nonlinearities in your amplifier chain, then you don't distort the decision boundaries, which are just lines away from the origin. And so this, you kind of get the best of both the worlds. If you run this through a nonlinear amplifier, the outer constellation points get squeezed in a little bit, uh, but uh, you don't necessarily disturb the detection. Uh, you can, if this is at least the way that the points are aligned, it's resistant to some of those other phase errors or uh, nonlinear errors. And you can see that when you go up to about 15 dB signal-to-noise ratio, now another constellation kicks in. This has 32 uh, states in its constellation diagram, so that would mean 2 to the 5th or 5 bits per symbol for that diagram. The, the signal-to-noise ratio has gotten high enough where I can now support that type of modulation scheme. And again, we've now split into three rings, but we're using some of the same principles, trying to fill up space, but doing it in a clever way that resists nonlinearities in your amplifier design.
So any questions about this graph before we move on? It's just an actual uh, 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 transmission standard for a satellite. I see we're getting up to about 80 megabits per second, it says, close to 10 dB of signal-to-noise ratio. So it's really pretty cooking. Now, just as a few side notes on uh, terrestrial video, if you wanted to send video streams on, uh, on Earth rather than via a satellite, the HDTV standard and the digital standard for uh, terrestrial transmission, the original digital standard uses an MPEG-2 uh, encoder and this thing called 8VSB modulation. There are 10 million ways to configure a modulation scheme. If you understand the, the basic principles that we've learned in this class, no doubt you'll come across some crazy scheme that somebody has cooked up in the past or some PhD student is working for in the future that may be incorporated into some communication standards you're working with. All of the principles are the same. I'll show you what 16 VSB looks like in a second. 256 QAM with higher SNR, you know what 256 QAM is. That's when you take the... Uh, eight, um, 256 points in a grid formation. That's so basically 16 by 16. And you transmit eight, two to the eighth, eight bits per symbol. All, and of course, most analog stations have been removed off the air. There was this deadline in 2009 that I think slipped several years, but they eventually got rid of most of them. Here's what 8 VSB looks like. Let's apply what we learned about our spectral principles. You take a baseband signal that has eight, uh, let's see, yeah, eight levels in it, and you send Pulses, these are represented by square pulses, but there's likely a little more filtering and, and pulse shaping going on. But you take that signal, you modulate it onto a carrier, and then you slice off half the sideband. Remember we talked about single sideband techniques. And so you can slice off half the sideband because when you mix it down, you can recover that information. You're not losing any information you, when you do that. So what does that look like? Spectrally speaking, here's a, a spectrum analyzer diagram of an 8 VSB video signal modulated onto a carrier. The carrier frequency, because you've chopped off the sideband, is actually that little spike to the left, and then the rest of the signal is off on the right. You typically send about three bits per symbol, because you've got eight different levels, two to the three. You do about 10 mega symbols per second, and that results in about 32 megabits per second to send your video channel. And the nice thing about this is that when it's all shored up spectrally, it's designed to fit in the old 6 megahertz analog TV channel. And so when the IQ diagram, it looks kind of strange, these 8 VSB signals, because you chopped off the sideband, it makes them all look messed up. That uh, You kind of see the, the levels in I, but the Q is kind of smeared because you chopped off the sideband. And then when, if you have higher signal-to-noise ratios, you use a 64 QAM, transmit 8 bits per second. So those are common schemes that uh, are used nowadays in transmission. Another scheme that's used in video transmission, somewhat on satellites, but uh, quite a bit on, free, on earthbound transmitters, you'll see a lot of work recently on OFDM. This is also a standard that's worked its way into the cellular standard, um, a lot, the latest wireless networking standards. It stands for orthogonal frequency division multiple access. I will show you this hideously complicated looking block diagram for modulating it, and then I will explain what it actually looks like, which really isn't that bad. It really isn't that bad. The, the concept is actually pretty simple. So here's the, here's the transmitter. It makes it look really impressive when you look at it up here until you realize what it's actually doing. You start off on the left, you send a signal in, and you multiplex it. So you take a bit stream and you turn it into a bunch of parallel bits. 
and you run it through an inverse Fourier transform. Then you modulate it. Then you send it on a carrier. See, there's, there's, uh, it's being sent on both uh, uh, an I and a Q channel. We've got our standard block diagram for IQ modulation at that point. And then at the receiver, which is shown in the bottom part, you take the signal in, you digitize it, and then you take a fast Fourier transform. Uh, so basically, starting with an inverse Fourier transform, then you take a fast Fourier transform, and then you demultiplex the signal. Well, that's how anybody would t teach you how to do uh, OFDM if they were starting from a COM theory perspective. Let me go to the board now. I think we're pretty much done with the computer. So, if I have a digital signal, let's start with something simple. Antipodal square wave, one, zero, one, zero. And let's say I do some pulse shaping to it. Let's do this right. Let's say I now, instead of that, I have something like a sync pulse. which is going to, you know, I don't know what it's exactly it's going to do in between here, but I'll have a one here, a negative one here, and relatively smooth transitions between them. Okay. So in the time domain, I take this signal and I run it through an inverse Fourier transform. Well, an inverse Fourier transform is actually the same thing as a Fourier transform. It's just a conjugate in the kernel. Use the exact same mathematical format. So this is effectively like, putting it in the spectral domain, but it's still in the time domain, right? So now, this is what the frequency looks like. Your frequency, if you looked at this thing on a spectrum analyzer, so after that operation of FFT minus 1, if you look on the, the spectrum analyzer, you'll see all those little carriers, which tend to add up and make a block. And these are actually your, di your bits, whatever your sequence may be. But they're modulated onto to these little carriers that now appear in the frequency domain. And they satisfy the Nyquist intersymbol interference criterion in the frequency domain. You could detect this one location here and none of the other subcarriers that have added in there. They're going to ring just like any realistic sync or raised cosine pulse, but they will not contribute interference, intersymbol interference at that particular frequency location. So really what you need is like a matched filter in terms of frequency. Well, we build match filters in terms of time, so that's why there's an FFT operation at the front end of an OFDM receiver that turns this back into the time domain for detection. But this is actually very powerful. There's a lot of really neat things that you can do with OFDM when you're transmitting bit sequences on effectively tiny little subcarriers smeared out over your band. This is very useful for broadband signals. For example, let's say... Um, this is a common problem in any kind of radio channel. Less so in satellite engineering, more in terrestrial engineering, but it's still an issue. That is that the channel is frequency selective, especially when you get to a very broad bandwidth. There's this thing called the coherence bandwidth of a channel. How long can you go in frequency before this channel starts changing? For uh, an indoor channel, oh gosh, what is it? It's about... Uh, but you'll, you'll be lucky to get a coherence bandwidth of like 3 to 5 megahertz. 
because there's so much multipath. It's a, a very dispersive channel. You get a lot of echoes, which means in the frequency domain, I get a lot of peaks and nulls, constructive and destructive fre frequency interference. Well, if I have to pass this signal through a channel that's doing this, that means that I can adjust how I treat each of these subcarriers, actually even give them different weightings. Or I can even give them different constellation points. So for example, let's say I've got a, one of my subcarriers is in the peak. I can I say, oh, the channel's really good. I, I do a little channel estimation. I send out a training sequence in my wireless channel. I get the feedback back from my receiver. It says, oh yeah, this frequency component, very high. Let's use high order modulation there. Let's use QPSK or let's use uh, 16 QAM. And then your other subcarrier that you're using is in a fade. You can say, well, this is not a very high SNR. If I want to get data through, maybe I should just turn that subcarrier off. It's not high enough to be used. Or maybe I want to use uh, binary phase shift keying, something that's a little more reliable to detect in a low SNR environment. If you're managing a cellular network, turning this off completely might be beneficial. It doesn't give you the maximum throughput to a user terminal. However, I don't really want to transmit crummy carriers, even if it means I can boost my data rate to one of my users. Because chances are somebody else can use that same frequency component in their link with higher SNR. And so one of the, the, the hallmarks of LTE, the, the kind of 4G standard that's used in mobile communications nowadays, it uses a, a version of OFDM where there's this sort of space, time, uh, space frequency matrix of, of subcarriers that carry data to your phone. And you're assigned several different subcarriers and over time, they can jump around depending on how your channel changes. And then another set of subcarriers is assigned to a different user. And it's this huge optimization problem. It was one of the reasons why LTE is so good at wringing every last drop of capacity out of your data hostile, frequency selective, fading all the time in different ways, mobile wireless channel. It's an immense amount of engineering went into that standard. And uh, this is how it does it. At the end of the day, what is it doing? It's really just using different subcarriers. And it's putting higher or lower order modulation on them as you need it. So you know everything in this class, how to understand an LTE system, even though we didn't talk about it. Incidentally, if you are interested in learning about uh, more kind of systems radio classes, we offer a really good mobile communications class here at the graduate level. Some of you may have taken it already. But uh, it's a good follow-up class if you're really interested in more of the, the down-to-earth communications. Um, I, I forget when they offer that. Are they offering that in the fall? Anybody looked at the course catalog? No? Anybody taken that before, that class before? No? Well, shame on you. You guys are exempt. I, I, don't, I don't expect you to take that. You're probably busy enough learning about astrodynamics and jet combustion, or I don't know what classes you people take. I would like to sit in on one, one of them one day. That would be fun. Take some aerospace engineering classes. OK. So any questions about digital modulation? This kind of, these kind of last really complicated modulation schemes uh, we're not going to do with anything on them on the test. You just need to know that they exist. And you'll see variations of them again as you go out and practice. But it's really the concepts of translating a, a constellation, signal constellation, um, a symbol rate into a reusable bit rate. What does pulse shaping do? You know, how to evaluate different pulse shapes. The basics. Keeping in mind that these have dramatic repercussions in a satellite communications 
network, right? Really, in satellite engineering, you apply all of these. So there's kind of a um, philosophical difference in comlink design, right? When you are trying to do communications in terrestrial uh, communications, quite often you're just trying to wring the most bits per second out of the out of your spectral resources. You've got a maximum power level that you're capped at. You've got a frequency band you've got to stay in. You want to deliver as many bits per second to your user in a shared radio spectrum. In a satellite link, because of spatial multiplexing, and you may not have to share as much, you tend to be more worried about things like power consumption and how expensive does my satellite have to be and what are the power constraints that I place upon it if I have to transmit at this level as opposed to this level. So you may be using things like coding gain and modulation scheme and higher order modulation to try to bring down the required transmit power um, or simplify the front end of the, of the transmitter, try to use a, a lower cost or more reliable transmit amplifier or a more efficient, energy efficient amplifier. because that saves you millions of dollars and extends the lifetime, useful lifetime of your, your satellite because now your solar cells get smaller, your spacecraft gets less massive, which means the loss launch is going to be cheaper. You need less station-keeping fuel or the same amount of station-keeping fuel will add five years of lifetime to your satellite under the new weight reduction that you've been able to achieve by designing your communications link properly. It's very difficult to, to the, sat, the design of a satellite communication system is very much like trying to install carpet. You know, you get the carpet installed, you get everything tacked in, and there's a couple of lumps. You bang down one lump, and you don't realize that banging down one lump creates a lump over here. And then you bang down that one, and that one makes two lumps over here. And so it's, it's a, a challenge to pin everything down because there's a lot of interdependencies that don't exist in other forms of communication systems or just exist in a different way. <laughs>